on this edition of the Fifth Estate. Call it the fog of war. Say it's because truth is the first casualty. This is not a combat mission, and our role is clearly defined. Or blame it on Ottawa. But Canada's military role in the fight against the Islamic State may be the most secretive Canadian mission ever. Ahead, the war you haven't seen. Video smuggled to the Fifth Estate. Brave people behind enemy lines, risking their lives to talk to you. Do you know how it feels to go out in the morning and find a head in the street? And troubling questions for the new Prime Minister about the hidden toll of coalition bombing. Every time you kill a local who's not a fighter, you're creating 10 or maybe hundreds of new enemies. I'm Bob McEwen, near the front in northern Iraq, with the story of Canada's hidden war. This is the Fifth Estate. The human toll is staggering. Hundreds of thousands killed, more than four million refugees, tens of millions displaced and otherwise victimized by this war. Yet we seem to understand so little of what's happened in Iraq and Syria, or why. Historically, politically, religiously, such unknown, not to say unknowable places. In starting this story, we were drawn to these shocking images. They're the ruins of a city in Syria called Derizor, though it could be Dresden or Hiroshima after World War II. About 100,000 people still reside amidst the rubble, half the population before the war and Islamic State occupation. And it was here that we learned about a young man we'll call Rami. We made contact with him, and he bravely agreed to talk to us weekly. A real-time diary of real life under Islamic State. In a way, it is Rami's war. There are no words to express what I feel. I am afraid every moment. Every moment I fear arrest. But I also dream of becoming a savior of my people. I feel the people of Deir Zor are my responsibility. Over four months, he's called on Skype each week, sharing his hopes, dreams, and the nightmare of Islamic State. He knows he's risking his life to do it, which is why from week one, he's spoken to us only with his face hidden. But it wasn't always like this in Deir Ezzor. Not long ago, this was a peaceful city on the ancient Euphrates River. Now, 22, Rami was raised on a farm nearby the first in his large family to study at the local university. I am the youngest and most ambitious. My mother urged me to study hard and become a professional. She said she wanted me to be the best in my class. His college days were happy ones. The campus, a place for learning, laughter, music. Jeans were acceptable attire, even for women. The niqab or burqa, a matter of choice. And it's here that Rami met a girl and fell in love. The first time I saw her, I felt butterflies in the stomach. I don't know how to describe it. I told my family that I want to propose, but when I talked with her family, they said it is still too early, and you're both students. They said that I have to finish school before marriage. The future had seemed so bright, but then in 2014, Islamic State arrived. I remember the first time I saw ISIS convoys. The ISIS flags were coming closer. Their voices were coming louder. The people here were screaming, we're going to die. At first, as you can see in this video smuggled out of Deir Ezzor and obtained by the Fifth Estate, there was a veneer of normal life, at least for those willing to swear allegiance to the extreme edicts of Islamic State. Rami says many simply took the path of least resistance. Islamic State is making us wear black and white cloaks. People used to take pride in their appearances. Now they dress so they won't attract ISIS attention. 
Rami's grandmother was arrested and fined for not wearing a veil and showing her eyes in public. When the family explained her eyesight was badly failing, IS said the law was clear she could wear the veil or stay home. In Derizor, residents have been forced to study the Islamic State version of Sharia law or be killed. And everyone knows that for the crime of apostasy, abandonment of Islam, retribution is unforgiving. Again, this is smuggled video never seen before. My cousin was arrested by Islamic State about five months ago. They accused him of apostasy. I ran to see him before the execution, but when I arrived, his body was crucified and his head was between his legs. The picture is still in my head. When Rami could no longer study at the university, he decided to join a group called Derizor 24, which documents atrocities committed here for the outside world. Rami also decided to talk to us. Do you know how it feels to go out in the morning and find a head in the street or a crucified body? He seems to believe Western nations like Canada might one day come to rescue them from Islamic State. Where is the rest of the world? The West can stop the war if they want to. But without independent observers to tell the world this story, most of what gets out is highly produced execution porn video, like this. Spreading terror in the population by showing what happens when people like Rami are captured. Islamic State says these are all citizen reporters who got caught. Remarkably, that didn't discourage Jürgen Todenhofer, a 74-year-old German author and activist. He also set out to witness and report the reality of Islamic State. Though it's no secret he's an outspoken critic, he managed to negotiate the guarantee of safe passage for a visit behind IS lines. I had said publicly before that this is uh, not an Islamic movement, this is a, a, a brutal terror movement. They knew my opinion, but they said, you will come back safe. And I must say they kept this promise. Ultimately, he got permission not only to interview Islamic State fighters, but to openly challenge what he believes is their criminal interpretation of Islam. There were those who actually engaged on that? Yeah, we discussed every day Islam and the Quran, and I said 113 of the 114 chapters, surahs of the Quran start with the words in the name of God, most gracious and most merciful. Where is your mercy? Where's your mercy? Mercy is not something associated with the man who was Totenhofer's guide and driver through all of this. By the way, the IS driver, our IS driver was Jihadi John. That's what he said. None other than Jihadi John. I'm back, Obama, and I'm back because of your arrogant foreign policy towards the Islamic State. Because of your he became internationally infamous when he beheaded American journalist James Foley. Have you taken your actions? It was just three weeks after Foley's murder in 2014 that President Barack Obama announced a dramatic expansion in the U.S. war against Islamic State. My fellow Americans, our objective is clear. We will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy. President Obama has requested a commitment of Canadian military advisors. Canada would quickly sign up, though with conditions that made the commitment sound more like teaching or counseling than warfare. This is not a combat mission and our role is clearly defined. Officially, here are the numbers. Six Canadian jet fighters, 600 air crew and staff, 69 special forces operating from this base in northern Iraq, ostensibly for training only. On the ground, no one at the front lines, and no combat. 
But then, just six months later, came the shocking news that Sergeant Andrew Duaron had been killed, not in an office or classroom, but at the front. His death would trigger controversy about what Canadian forces really are doing in Syria and Iraq. When we come back... It's a dangerous job. To do that, you have to have a direct line of sight. You have to be pretty darn close. But Canada's got to do it. It is no less a combat role than dropping a bomb on an enemy target. They're both combat. The following program may contain scenes that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. How did it happen? Two years ago, we'd barely heard of them. Today, the so-called Islamic State is the world's most notorious terrorist force, fighting a U.S.-led coalition that includes Canada, Great Britain, Germany, France, and others, and opposed separately by Russia and Iran. Yet IS now controls a massive tract of land in Syria and Iraq, bigger than Britain, with totalitarian rule over 10 million people. When the Fifth Estate set out to tell the story of Canada's hidden war, it was immediately clear where we had to go. To northern Iraq, where the Canadian ground troops are based, 69 Special Forces Operators, as they're known, were sent here to advise and assist, officially a training mission. But they are a battle-hardened group and secretive, stationed in this isolated area within minutes of the front lines. Former Canadian sniper Jody Middick served three tours of duty in Afghanistan and Kosovo. These are our SEAL Team 6 guys. These are our, you know, our, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, Green Berets. These are our Whatever you think of as uh, special forces or special operations, that's, these are our best guys. Along the highway north, there are frequent security checkpoints. Islamic State can be just a kilometer or two away, meaning this road is often within mortar range. The Canadian base is an unimposing collection of trailers. The special forces often work at night and sleep by day, so the compound can look deserted. But this is as close to someone in a Canadian uniform as any journalist here can get with a camera. Back in Ottawa, there are periodic media briefings. But here in Iraq, citing security, the Department of National Defense refused our requests for access to any Canadian personnel or operations, even training, or any interviews on or off the record. Make no mistake about it, the Special Forces operators here at Canada's forward base in northern Iraq are the Canadian military's best and brightest, and they don't do photo ops or news conferences. Be that as it may, after over a year of the fight against Islamic State, there have been almost no facts released to the Canadian public about what's happening here, an absence of information virtually unprecedented in any other Canadian war. In fact, it's the first major conflict all the way back to World War I not to have journalists with Canadian troops in the field or at the front. According to Afghanistan veteran Jody Middick, combat soldiers may prefer it that way. There is a, a feeling that if there's a litmus test in democracy, it's how a government deals with the truth during times of war. Right. Um, there's a lot that happens in war that you don't know about. You know, there's still files that are closed from World War II. Is it good or bad? I know that for the troops on the ground, it's probably good especially in today's day and age, the more that's known, the less they're effective they're going to be at their job. The key part of the Canadian job here is to be military mentors to these men, called the Peshmerga, which translates to those who face death, the legendary Kurdish fighters from northern Iraq. And while Canada's military refused to talk to us, the Peshmerga were pleased to do it especially about the important tactical role of the Canadians. The Peshmerga invited us to the front, within sight of Islamic State territory. They say the Canadian Special Forces are a regular presence here, not only for training, but also to direct bombing runs. It's here at the Peshmerga Operations Centre that they plan their collaboration with the Canadians. 
General Nur al-Din Hussein is the commanding officer. They are coming here and discuss with us the targeters, and they are help us in the train. The advice to uh, how to get targets from mm -hmm. the enemy and how to hit them. And how much do they help you, in fact? It's many times, yeah. Two, twice in a week. Well, we thank them every day because they're coming. We need the coalition here. Without the coalition, well, maybe we can't do what we do now. And the crucial aspect of that partnership is the high-stress job of directing airstrikes identifying targets by laser. It works like this. A laser beam is aimed at a potential Islamic State target. When the laser makes contact, which requires a direct line of sight, it pinpoints that target for aircraft above with missiles or bombs. For Canada's soldiers, it is unquestionably a high-risk assignment. Canada is doing the mission a little bit differently than the other countries and in an important way. Matthew Fisher of Post Media is Canada's longest serving foreign correspondent. In the past 30 years, he's arguably been to more war zones than any Canadian journalist ever. He says Canada's targeters were closer to the front than anyone else in the coalition. The risky part comes when you go forward to teach the Peshmerga how to laser targets and when you laser some targets yourself. Because to do that, you have to have a direct line of sight on the target and to have a direct line of sight, you have to be pretty darn close. And uh, that puts them within great proximity of Islamic State forces. But remember back then the Tory government insisted this would not be a combat mission for Canada's ground troops. Canada is joining our allies in providing critical advice to forces in northern Iraq as they continue to hold back the terrorist advance. Initially, they also claimed none of the soldiers would operate at the front. But on March 6th, when Sergeant Andrew Duara was killed in a friendly fire incident on the front lines, it made clear the Canadians were right in the middle of it. General Michel Gauthier was commander of Canada's military operations worldwide until he retired in 2009. Is something like painting a target with a laser a combat role in your estimation? Um, it is no less a combat role than, than dropping a bomb on an enemy target. They're both combat. And clearly the, the, this, this whole debate and tap dancing around in combat um, I suppose I understand just by virtue of, you know, political dynamics and so on, but th the reality is it's a combat mission. It is, and, and you can't escape that. And General Gauthier says whenever Canadian combat troops deployed under him, to Afghanistan, for example, he was concerned by one potential problem beyond all else. And top of that list was civilian casualties. Explicitly, where everybody is is sensitized to this. So when you ask um, uh, how sensitive a subject is, it, it's, it's enormously... That's because collateral damage, especially civilian fatalities, can profoundly alter the course of a war. The challenge, of course, is every time you, you uh, kill a local uh, who's not a fighter, uh, an innocent civilian, uh, woman, child, and so on, uh, you're creating 10 or maybe hundreds of new enemies. This is official coalition video of the bombing campaign. We wanted to find out how much of an issue civilian casualties have been during this air war. In an exclusive interview via video link from Kuwait, we spoke to the Canadian commander in the coalition, Brigadier General Lise Bourgon, about the Canadian airstrikes so far. How would you evaluate the effectiveness of those? Our CF-18 have accounted for 12% of all non-US coalition strikes, so it's quite an accomplishment for Canadian participation. How important in an air campaign is the issue of civilian casualties? The safety of the Iraqi population is extremely important to us. When we develop those targets, we spend 
hundreds of hours looking at the ground, making sure that we have a full picture of what's going on. And we really do our utmost to really ensure that uh, we don't target civilians, that we only go against ISIS capabilities. In other words, with at least 181 airstrikes by Canada since the start of coalition bombing, the Canadians claim no civilian casualties whatsoever. Quite a record, if true. So August 24, 11 more civilians from one family. The fifth estate set out to discover how diligent our military has been in investigating these cases. Canada is the only coalition country to post detailed bombing records. We reviewed those, along with reports of civilian casualties. And this Pentagon document listing dozens of coalition airstrikes with possible collateral damage. Our research first led us here, a location in northern Iraq called Kissick Junction. They would have been deployed by then. It was January 21st, a bombing run by Canadian jet fighters. Below, a battle raged where Islamic State controlled a key highway and the Peshmerga fought to take it back. The mission for Canada's jet fighters, take out a rooftop position housing IS snipers and a heavy machine gun. It was mission accomplished for the CF-18s, the gun placement destroyed. But according to the Pentagon, after that airstrike, a local Peshmerga soldier gave information to the coalition's special forces, alleging Canadian bombs had caused civilian fatalities, as many as 27 of them. The Canadian military looked at aircraft video of the bombing and concluded allegations of civilian casualties were not credible. From Canadian headquarters in Kuwait, we asked General Lise Bourgain how they could be so sure about that. We also were able, with the amount of data that we had, to, uh, to ensure ourselves that there was no civilian casualties, uh, no civilian presence around the target. We had video of almost two weeks of coverage of that compound, so we had seen uh, who came in and out of that ISIS compound, and they were no civilian. Now, in the case of Kissick, the, the uh, original allegations came from a uh, Peshmerga soldier passed on by a uh, coalition special forces operator. Did you speak to both of them? No, we did not speak. So the coalition, they all they did a review. Canada did a review, and both sides concluded that there was no evidence of, uh, of civilian casualties or disproportionate uh, collateral damage. Did you speak to anyone in the vicinity to find out if there were reports of people being killed or wounded? No, we did not speak again when a review is conducted. We just look at the end of our own platform. When the general refers to a platform, she's talking about whatever video they had available from the air. The Canadians admit they consulted no one on the ground. So the Fifth Estate did what the military didn't. We contacted the hospital near Kissick. We were told that on the day in question, January 21st, doctors there saw nine victims of explosions, eight of whom died. Now, we can't know if they were casualties of coalition bombing or not, but we do know the Canadian military never even contacted the hospital to try to find out. Lawyer Chris Jenks served in the U.S. Army for 20 years, 11 as a judge advocate investigating collateral damage. He says he can't comprehend why the Canadians didn't interview the original sources of that civilian casualty report. It's hard to understand why you wouldn't want to and be able to talk to, if not the Peshmerga, ideally the person, the English-speaking allied soldier who made the, uh, who made the report, or at least the U.S. Uh, Army uh, special operator who, uh, who conveyed the report. So it's tough to understand why you wouldn't uh, want the context. As we continued to comb through bombing records, our research would raise questions about the Canadian airstrikes that Justin Trudeau has pledged to end. And it would lead us to this mysterious woman from inside Islamic State territory, risking capture, torture, execution, to tell the world about the other side of what the coalition calls precision bombing. 
as you'll see when we come back. The following program may contain scenes that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. It is week four of our communication with Rami in the occupied city of Derizor, Syria, the young man behind Islamic State lines who's been telling us about life under IS. Rami and the group Derizor24 have continued to smuggle video to us, capturing the reality that Islamic State doesn't want to get out. He knows they're looking for him. IS is banned Wi-Fi. Fighters scour his neighborhood and troll the internet, searching for anyone in touch with the outside world. Islamic State is looking for people who work against it. They are looking for me and the others who put their lives in danger to deliver the truth to the world. In the summer, we received this smuggled video of aircraft overhead. Coalition bombers, Rami says. He's told us he hopes the Western world eventually will come to the rescue. Now, it seems they're finally here. Yesterday, coalition planes flew over Deir Ezzor without attacking. I feel a little bit happy when I hear the coalition planes. They may kill some Islamic State fighters. I hope the coalition will kill them. But when the airstrikes begin, Rami is no longer so sure about the outcome. The coalition airstrikes are good when they target Islamic State, but they are not when they kill civilians. He tells us about civilian casualties a family killed in what he believes was a coalition bombing of a city in the Derizor region called Bukamal. For him, too close to home. I also have nightmares of airstrikes bombing my home. In fact, the first reports of what happened on July 30th in Bukamal were these photos of the alleged victims, children, posted online by none other than Islamic State. But we checked with the respected Syrian Network for Human Rights, which examined and verified the accuracy of those pictures. It claims coalition airstrikes on July 30th wounded 17 and killed two, among them this child. There were numerous bombings in the Derizor region that day, including by Canadian planes. But the coalition says it's assessed this allegation and claims it's not credible. And as our investigation continued, we were drawn to another airstrike. This one, in the central Iraqi city of Fallujah. According to this internal Pentagon document obtained by the Fifth Estate, the incident took place on December 21st, the bombing of a suspected Islamic State weapons facility by Canadian and Australian jets. After the bombing, aircraft video showed two possible civilian casualties, a woman and child. But that Pentagon report concluded a lack of urgency, indicated their injuries weren't life-threatening. Further inquiry was deemed unnecessary. Former U.S. Judge Advocate Chris Jenks says the wording of that reflects a common military response to collateral damage investigations. Avoidance. I don't expect you to be happy about uh, investigations, but recognize when you are essentially blowing things up, when you're breaking things and wounding and killing people, investigations are gonna be part and parcel uh, of that equation. But in fact, there seems good reason to have investigated possible civilian casualties after the Canadian airstrike in Fallujah on December 21st. We found this BBC Arabic story reporting seven civilians wounded and 13 killed in shelling or coalition bombing. Why didn't that spark further inquiry? Is there a way of getting time to line up with those names? We also contacted a doctor from the Fallujah Hospital, who confirms he saw some casualties on that date, though he stresses his records show them admitted earlier in the day, before the airstrikes were said to have taken place. And it's not clear if there were other casualties, or what happened to the woman and boy mentioned in the Pentagon report. What is clear? The Canadian military never contacted the hospital or the doctor. 
presumably they never saw that BBC article. And apparently they also missed the allegations about Fallujah in the Pentagon document on civilian casualties. Though Canada's role in the raid was on a detailed list of airstrikes that DND posts online. We asked General Lise Bourgain how that was overlooked. Now that is, a, is a, an event that's documented on the DND website as involving Canadian aircraft. Well, again, I'll go back. I'm, I'm, in, I'm not aware of any other allegation of civilian casualties. In fact, in the coalition bombing campaign, our research found nearly 50 documented allegations of civilian casualties, involving as many as 600 possible fatalities. Other independent observers and analysts put the civilian death toll even higher. Yet publicly, the coalition admits to only two civilian casualties. That's out of a total of almost 8,000 coalition airstrikes in Iraq and Syria. It does seem to strain credulity. Recognize that, again, when humans are involved and all it takes is a wind gust or I never expected someone on a bicycle to ride through, you know, while the missile or the bomb was in air, inevitably you're going to have some civilian uh, casualties no matter uh, how many precautions you take. Let us be clear, Canada and the rest of the coalition in Iraq and Syria are fighting a formidable and brutal enemy. In the past two years, Islamic State has killed tens of thousands of innocent people, maybe more. And the coalition maintains it wants to minimize civilian casualties at all costs. But the questions are, is that really possible in a war where IS is using civilians as human shields? And if something does go wrong in an airstrike, what can or should countries like Canada do to stop it from happening again? Canadian journalist Matthew Fisher is skeptical of many collateral damage claims, but says this is a crucial part of Islamic State strategy against an air war. The Islamic State, and they've made this clear, they are in more and more with the local population because the few times they haven't been, they've got whacked. So, of course, they hide among the local population. Not that the local population probably wanted them. They'd take a house over with guns. And that is happening in spades in Iraq. The whole strategy of the Islamic State now is to disperse among the population. People just don't know that bombarding means killing civilians. The people just don't know it. German author and journalist Jürgen Todenhofer spent time inside the occupied city of Mosul and witnessed the bombing devastation. He says civilian casualties are the inevitable result of the coalition air war. If you want, for example, to eliminate all the IS fighters in Mosul, between five and 10,000 IS fighters, you would have to destroy the whole city of Mosul, which has still at least 1.5 million inhabitants. It's not possible to destroy a guerrilla force like IS with bombs, and it is not responsible. Which brings us to this journalist who resides in the occupied city of Mosul. We'll call her Layla. At great personal risk, she managed to make the treacherous journey from behind Islamic State lines, much of it on foot, taking an overland route to meet us near the front. Mostly, she lives in the shadows because her mission as a journalist is to do what no one else is, investigate airstrikes and document civilian casualties. It's my territory. I'm working in my territory in the war that's taken over my city the city that's become victim of the Islamic State and the airstrikes because I want to make our voices heard. We've talked to the coalition. They deny that civilian casualties have taken place. They say it's their highest priority. On the contrary, that's not true. It's not true at all. I can show you the names of the people killed. They were all civilians, and I have records and proof for that. Layla provided us with what she says are first-hand details of bombing by coalition and Iraqi government planes in Mosul and surroundings. She maintains she's seen the bodies of hundreds of civilian casualties at the Mosul morgue. She has names of many she says were killed, including entire families with children. 
We could not independently verify her work, but Layla says she gets her information from people she trusts, who feel the same way she does. My sources include military and police people, medical people, and I know them personally, and all they care about is to show the reality of airstrikes and civilian casualties. When we return, a new government in Ottawa vows to change the mission and end Canadian airstrikes. And in enemy territory, a young man ponders his future under Islamic State occupation. I've seen way more than I was supposed to. I want to live as a human. The following program may contain scenes that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. One Prime Minister sent them in. CF-18 jet fighters for the coalition air war against Islamic State. And on the ground, Canadian special forces along the front line. The question facing the next Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, what to do about Canada's military role in Iraq and Syria. The commitment ends in March. What then? His campaign promise was to dramatically decrease Canada's contribution to the war. Uh, we are going to uh, withdraw from the bombing mission uh, over Iraq and Syria, and we are going to shift towards a training mission. So what does the coalition think about that? The next day in Washington, the arm twisting began. One of Trudeau's first official calls came from Barack Obama, the president's position conveyed by White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest. Uh, we certainly are hoping that they'll continue to be to play that important role that they've played thus far. Whatever form Canada's future participation in Iraq takes, virtually no one predicts the defeat of Islamic State soon. The conflict against them likely to be measured not in months or years, but decades. Meanwhile this week, more smuggled video arrived. A chilling scene from the city of Deir Ezzor in Syria. A woman in a niqab, publicly flogged. According to witnesses, she was accused of stealing from Islamic State for removing a few personal belongings from her home after IS fighters laid claim to it. It's no longer just brutal violence in Deir Ezzor, but also unbearable sadness. What about Rami, the young man recording real life under Islamic State for us? These days, he says, his only escape is in the thoughts of the girl he wants to marry. But he hasn't spoken to her for months, and he's been told her family has ties to Islamic State. I haven't heard anything new about my love. I'm still afraid that her family may force her to marry some ISIS person, that her uncle will offer her to an ISIS fighter to get ahead. Dreams are now nightmares in the Deir Ezzor rubble. And Rami is thinking the unthinkable. He can't foresee the day IS will be beaten, so he's weighing the possibility of protecting his family by joining up. I don't blame some of the people who did join ISIS, because I know the reasons that made them do that. If at some point I feel that my family will be affected, I might think about joining ISIS. And what of Layla? The journalist investigating civilian casualties seems to have a growing sense of desperation, too. Even now, we should be considered martyrs because this is not life that we are living. We are dead, but alive, and I'll be proud to be seen as a martyr if I show the truth to the world. Despite it all, she says she'll continue her work. She believes the coalition has to know the consequences of all those bombs. Unfortunately, the people of Mosul are afraid of both ISIS and the coalition forces. Now Layla's among them. She recently told us she has to move after Islamic State brought mortar launchers into her neighborhood, effectively making her and her children coalition targets too. Rami knows the feeling of being torn between hopes for the future and the harsh reality of life under Islamic State. I'm 22. 
But I feel like a hundred. I've seen way more than I was supposed to. I want to live as a human. We are dying slowly, and nobody is here to help. 